Every truth in the scripture remains the same forever. In Tehillim chapter 119 verse 89, the scripture says, Forever, O Yahuwah, your word is settled in heaven. That means every truth mentioned in the scripture remains forever. It never changes or alters, especially it does not change for men. Now in this video, some of the information in this video may not be suitable for young viewers. Nonetheless, I strove to remain factual as well as biblical. Some of the information in this video may be offensive to you. That is not my intent. My intent is to show the comparison between the forever settled word of the Most High compared to the acts and beliefs and practices of men. Men will always fail. Men will always lose. But the word of the Most High will never fail. It is settled in heaven. I would hope that in viewing this video, two parts, I discovered that it must be done in two parts because of the volume of information. I would hope that in viewing this information, you will receive enlightenment and truth from the scriptures that will help to guide and direct your life. So to the esteem of the Most High, Elohim Yah, Shalom. The practice of Christianity has evolved in a downward trend since the first century taught ones. The teachings and adherence to scripture were heavily infiltrated during the reign of the Roman Emperor Constantine. Constantine's Christianity produced Catholicism, out of which came the protesters of Lutheran and his 95 theses nailed to a church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Then you have Calvinism, Presbyterian, Anglican, Puritan, Baptist, Methodist, and African Methodist Episcopal, a reaction to Methodist, Independent, Seventh-day Adventist, Church of Christ, Pentecostalism, Charismatic, and on and on. Each denomination claiming some aspect and belief of Christ all of whom believe they are the true followers of Messiah. The information in this video is squarely focused on the actions and end results of voices of preachers of the Pentecost and Charismatic movement, which reveals much of the Christian religion as diametrically opposed to the laws and commandments of the Most High. Because in the end, let Elohim be true, and every man, a liar. This video is an observation and a biblical teaching given to me by the Ruach HaKodesh. It is not meant to offend or upset anyone. I have to say that because I know that many times Christians get angry and upset when they hear a teaching that does not line up with what they understand and what they've been taught. But if you bear in mind the solid truth of scripture that will be presented in this, in this video, and you are a true believer, a true Hebrew of the Most High, the truth in this video will resonate in your Ruach. Because the Most High cannot lie, and He cannot die. So please take this information as spiritual edification for your soul, Drink it in and teach others this truth as you yourself abide by this truth. 
and allow your body to truly be the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh. Several scriptures are the foundation to the contradictory demise of many charismatic preachers, specifically those who have specialized in the word of faith and healing platforms, both men and women. The first scripture is found in the book of Genesis. And Yahuwah said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever in his going astray. He is flesh and his days shall be 120 years. That's Bereshit chapter 6, verse 3, Genesis. We find the fulfillment of this verse in the life of Moshe. And Moshe was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his freshness gone. Deborim chapter 34, verse 7. That's the book of Deuteronomy. In Tehillim, Psalms 119.89, the word of the Most High reads as such. Forever, O Yahuwah, your word stands firm in the heavens. I will highlight certain preachers more than others because of their popularity and national status. We begin with a Pentecostal preacher of great reputation by the name William J. Seymour. Seymour was one of the most significant men, if not the significant man, in connection with the Azuzu or Azusa Street Revivals, an event that held reverential admiration for most charismatic Christians, especially those of the Church of God in Christ. April 9th, 1906, the location 214, Bonnie Bray Street. On the third day of a 10-day fast, William Seymour began to preach to the prayer group from Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Afterwards, Mr. Edward Lee asked Seymour, to lay hands on him, as they did in the scriptures, and pray that he would receive the Holy Ghost. When they finished, Lee lifted his hands and began speaking in tongues. This experience sent shockwaves through the room, and at the same time, a young lady named Jenny Moore fell from her stool where she was sitting. The power of God fell, and I was baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire with the evidence of speaking in tongues. As I looked at God, it seemed as if a vessel broke within me, and water surged up through my being, which when it had reached my mouth, it poured out in a torrent of languages God had given me. I sang under the power of the Spirit in many languages, and in the home where the meeting was held, the Spirit led me to the piano, where I played and sang under the inspiration, although I had not learned how to play. Several other believers in the room were knocked to the ground by the power of the Spirit, and six of them began to speak in tongues as well. Their shouts of joy could be heard throughout the neighborhood as the prayer meeting overflowed to the front porch. Many curious neighbors gathered, and soon others began speaking in tongues and praising God. The word spread rapidly. By the next morning, the crowd had grown so great that it was difficult to approach the house. The porch became a pulpit as William Seymour began to preach to the crowd. This continued for three days and nights. It has been said that during this three-day street service, the house shook under the exuberant praising of a hungry people. Even on one occasion, the porch collapsed at the weight of all the people. Services continued almost day and night with healings reported and hundreds of people filled with the Spirit. After the third day, it was determined that a new location was needed to house the growing crowd of seekers. William Seymour and his followers soon found a vacated two-story church building, previous used to stable horses. It had been converted into apartment housing upstairs 
with a large, unfinished, barn-like room on the downstairs. Its address was 312 Azusa Street. The revival at Azusa stretched from the early morning deep into the evening every day for three and a half years. One woman described the services with the following words. A sound like a rushing mighty wind filled the room and I was baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Rivers of joy and love divine flooded my soul. God also gave me the Bible evidence of receiving this experience and letting me speak in another language. But the greatest joy in my heart was the knowledge that I had received power to witness for Christ and power to tell others what great things God can do in a human life. William Seymour would preach and soon, following a sermon, the altars were flooded with seekers. No urging was necessary. By the end of the first month, you could find 800 people gathered within the building and over 500 gathered outside and it only continued to grow. There was such power in the preached word that people would shake in their seats and many would have the power fall on them as the word germinated in their hearts and they would burst out speaking or singing in other languages. Holy Spirit, would they lay hands on them or would they receive the baptism and speak with tongues back in the audience or did they have a tarrying room or what? Well, they had a room upstairs they called the upper room where you went to tarry for the Holy Spirit. But we could not control the Spirit of God. Sometimes a person would receive the Holy Ghost right in an audience without even an altar call. You just stand right up and begin speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave us. I maintain you don't have to come to a specific place called an altar. You give up in your heart and the Lord will save you then, there, wherever you are. The people heard them speak in their own language. The Japanese, Chinese, and all the different nationalities, they heard them speak and the gospel was preached to them. You mean they had not learned these languages? Oh no, they had not learned because the Spirit of God filled them. Now you saw this and heard this with your own ears. I certainly did. Thousands of people visited the mission services over the course of three years, whether they were drawn by a spiritual hunger or a fascination for the bizarre. Whatever the case, those who came were impacted. Many who came with unkind motives left full of the Holy Ghost and a desire to spread the message of Pentecost. Hundreds of people were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Then hundreds turned into thousands and thousands turned into millions. History records the Azusa Street Revival as the greatest revival to ever sweep across North America. More than any other time in Earth's history, we need the Spirit to fall again on us. Now is the time. Today is the day. We need a fresh outpouring of God's Spirit on our nation like never before. Seymour died in 1922 of a sudden heart attack. He was 52 years old, 68 years shy of 120, as declared in the scripture of truth. Seymour was not well and he was not healed. He died of an overpowering attack against his body. Charles Parham was connected with Seymour in ministry and the new movement of Pentecostalism. Parham disassociated himself with Seymour amidst allegations of racial disparities, sexual misconduct, even homosexuality. Whether these allegations are true or not does merit attention, but they are not the subject of this documentary. Parham died in 1929 of a serious heart condition. He was 55 years old. 65 years shy of 120 as declared in the scripture of truth. Parham was not well and he was not healed. He died of an overpowering attack against his body. As a side note, with all that alleged power and outpouring of the Holy Ghost, one would think there would be little 
to no issues involving racial disparities or scandals. Slavery officially ended in 1863, 43 years ago from 1906. About two generations and racial disparities were still on the front burner. The ink hadn't dried completely with President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, and race remained an issue, even amongst Pentecostalism preachers. At least, on paper, slavery ended. Sister Amy, as she was passionately known by. Her full name was Amy Simple McPherson. Her life is so dramatic and heretical. She is one of my highlighted faith healers. Please continue to watch as I introduce clips of professional documentaries of Sister Amy. farm girl who finds herself suddenly the darling of the media and the darling of Los Angeles. And I don't think she could handle it. How do you get time by yourself when you're the object of that kind of fascination and that kind of scrutiny? And how do you get off the stage? How do you do that gracefully? Not long after her return to Los Angeles on May 18, 1926, Sister Amy and her secretary went to nearby Venice Beach. There, 
something happened that would set the entire city abuzz. The secretary, watching McPherson swim from the beach, suddenly lost sight of her. After walking up and down the beach for quite some time, really terrified, she finally notified the hotel manager nearby that uh, Sister Amy had disappeared. Minnie Kennedy was convinced that um, Amy had drowned. Sister had been advertised to speak at the temple at night, and when the crowds got there, Minnie was there and Sister was not. And Minnie conducted the entire service without saying anything, even though rumors had circulated in the city suggesting that Amy had disappeared. And the parishioners sitting in the back could hear the newsboys outside shouting, Amy McPherson believed drowned. A few began sobbing. At the end of the service, Minnie Kennedy announced what the congregation had feared. Sister, she said, is with Jesus. But not everyone was convinced. One young journalist in this period believed that Amy had not actually drowned, but that this was a well-orchestrated publicity stunt, that this was going to be some sort of story of death and resurrection or redemption, and that Amy was going to come back. For 32 days, followers of Sister Amy held a vigil at the beach where she had disappeared. Meanwhile, the woman who had so skillfully used the media to promote her ministry was now the subject of a media frenzy. The press were having a field day with this story. And what they discovered was that McPherson's former radio engineer, a guy named Kenneth Ormison, had also disappeared around the same time Amy did. So rumors began spreading, and the newspapers sensationalized this, that maybe she had escaped away with him. Then, in the early morning hours of June 23, 1926, police knocked on the door of the parsonage at Angela's Temple, presenting Minnie Kennedy with stunning news. Her daughter had apparently walked out of the desert in Mexico and was in a hospital in Arizona. Amy Semple McPherson was alive. Minnie provided questions to verify her daughter's identity, questions that only Amy would have known, questions that had to do with the name of the dog on the farm in Ontario, things like that from her childhood. Amy's mother, her two children, and LA reporters all raced to the Arizona hospital to learn what had happened. McPherson's account was soon taken up by the silent film industry, which made theatrical versions of current events. Sister Amy's story is that while she was at the beach, a man and a woman approached her and they said, Sister, our baby is dying. Would you please come with us and pray for our child? They dragged her into the car and they chloroformed her. And when she woke up, she was in a shack in the desert. McPherson said she was taken to Mexico by kidnappers named Steve and Mexicali Rose. She was bound but managed to escape by severing ropes on the rim of an open tin can. There were some doubts first raised by someone in Arizona who said that her clothing and her shoes did not look as worn as he thought they would have if her story of wandering across the desert terrain had been true. On the face of it, this story sounds outrageous. But in fact, the FBI had been investigating a number of kidnapping rings in Southern California and just a few months earlier, a wealthy white Angelino had been kidnapped and taken down to Mexico. I've never believed the kidnapping story. The names themselves, Mexicali Rose, the whole story is far too melodramatic. I've always believed that up until this point, Amy felt that she was somewhat in control of her life, but that at this point, she was so tired and exhausted that she really wanted to leave behind everything. When she returned to Los Angeles, 30,000 people greeted Sister Amy at the train station. But the press didn't share her followers' unquestioning loyalty. And the rest of the year, the second half of 1926, would be taken up with 
raking Amy Semple McPherson over the coals and trying to penetrate every aspect of the story that she told about where she'd been during the six weeks of her absence. McPherson was now under the gaze of reporters across the entire nation, with articles in elite magazines such as Vanity Fair, Harper's, and The New Republic. The New York Times would publish as many articles on Sister Amy's saga as it had on the entire Scopes trial. Well, nowadays, celebrities do have some sense of what they're getting in for. In the 20s, that wasn't necessarily the case. These people who were moving into celebrity, the Mary Pickfords in, in film, and the Babe Ruth in, in sports, and the Amy Semple McPhersons in religion, they didn't know really what the rules were going to be and how it would change their lives. Within weeks of McPherson's return, the Los Angeles district attorney launched a grand jury investigation into her alleged kidnapping. At the hearing, everyone expected the DA to focus on whether there was enough evidence to identify and charge kidnappers in the case. And almost immediately, it's clear that the district attorney is not interested in finding out about Steve and Rose and these supposed kidnappers, but they're interested in prying into Amy's private sexual life. The DA grilled McPherson about her relationship with Kenneth Ormiston, implying that she had concocted the sensational kidnapping story to hide an affair. Ultimately, it was not kidnappers that he charged, but McPherson, with fabricating evidence, lying before a grand jury, and conspiracy to commit a hoax. He even argued that McPherson should go to jail. I asked people in Los Angeles about Sister Amy. They may or may not remember whether she was Pentecostal, uh, whether she had her hair bobbed, but everyone remembers the extraordinary contributions of the Angelus Temple Commissary during the Great Depression. They got there first with the most. Even as she fed the poor, McPherson argued that spiritual renewal ranked as the nation's top priority. She preached that economic and social reform would follow when America returned to God. During one 40-city campaign, Sister Amy delivered her unique mix of religion and politics to two million people, one in every 50 Americans. At the same time, she actually re-embraces the Pentecostalism of her childhood. She begins publicly speaking in tongues. She begins being proud of the fact that she was filled with the Spirit. And so we see her not being the Hollywood celebrity, but being the Pentecostal revivalist who is having an impact on individual Christians' lives. In September 1944, McPherson traveled to Oakland, one of the communities that had helped launch her during her early days as an itinerant preacher. One night, she went to bed kind of late because she always felt very keyed up after a performance. And she had some barbiturates, uh, which she frequently used for sleep. The next morning, her son came in to find her to try and get her prepared for this revival she was having in Oakland. And what he discovered was his mother unconscious on the floor. The official coroner's report was that it was accidental death, but her death was reported first as a suicide. In more than three decades as an evangelist, Amy Semple McPherson had touched the lives of millions. More famous than many movie stars, she had entwined religion with entertainment and politics to an unprecedented degree. McPherson's story illustrates the rise of a conservative, powerful wing within Christianity that is really trying to blind church and state, that really believes that the United States is a Christian nation, particularly ordained and founded by God, that has a unique role to play in this world. And that's the message she taught her followers, and that's the legacy that she still represents today. A reporter once asked Sister Amy what was her greatest wish in life. 
As a woman, she said, I would wish that I would have a happy Christian home, a devoted husband and family. But as an evangelist, she said, I would wish that I would have a public address system mighty enough to reach every person in the world with thousands of watts behind her every time she opened her mouth to speak and a radio station that never went off the air during her lifetime. I think it's safe to say that she came a lot closer to fulfilling that desire of her heart. Sister Amy died in 1944 in a hotel room of suspected drug overdose. She was 53 years old when she died. 45,000 people attended or viewed her body. 11 trucks transported $50,000 worth of flowers to her gravesite. 1,000 ministers of the Four Square Gospel paid tearful tribute. Millions of dollars passed through her hands when she was alive, but her estate amounted to $10,000. She died of the overpowering intake of drugs that stopped her heart. She died 67 years shy of 120, as declared in the scripture of truth. Sister Amy was not well, and she was not healed. Smith Wigglesworth is noted for raising 14 people from the dead. The problem is, there is no verifiable proof of his noted claims. Messiah himself endorsed the proof claim when he in the Gospel of Lucas chapter 5 at verses 13 and 14. And, and he stretched, stretched out, out his hand, hand and, and touched him, him saying, I desire it, be, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he ordered him to say it to no one, but go and show yourself to the priest. Wigglesworth died in 1947 while attending a friend's funeral, his recorded legend says. Smith Wigglesworth was 87 years old when he died, 33 years shy of 120, as declared in the scripture of truth. Wigglesworth was not well, and he was not healed. Fred Francis Bosworth, better known as F.F. F. Bosworth. Historians and scholars call him an ordinary man who walked with God. Bosworth, like many faith healers, was not as big a name as others like Wigglesworth, Seymour, Parham, and the so-called giants of faith. But his work falls under the same category of all faith healers. But like his predecessors, Bosworth died, having been ill and bedridden for about three weeks, surrounded by family. He died of a heart attack and was 81 years old, 39 years shy of 120, as declared in the scripture of truth. Bosworth was not well, and he was not healed. Jack Cole one of the first faith healers in the United States. He had a touring tent ministry after World War II, also known as the Man with Reckless Faith. At one of his tent revivals, Cole was publicly attempting to heal a boy who had been smitten with polio. Cole, as all so-called faith healers, told his mother to remove the boy's leg braces. The mother complied but the boy claimed he was experiencing excruciating pain. Subsequently, Cole was arrested for practicing medicine without a license. But a judge dismissed the case under the grounds Florida exempts divine healing under the law. 
Shortly thereafter, Cole became sick and underwent a tracheotomy to help his breathing after his muscles became paralyzed. Walking up and down these aisles. How many believe he's here to smite that old cancer, to heal that old tumor? To open them blinded eyes, to cause them old lame legs to leap for joy. Do you believe he's here tonight? Say amen. Can you feel his presence right now? Say amen. Hallelujah. Would I lower the dignity of the pulpit too much if I took my coat off? Amen. Well, I'm going to anyhow, because it's hot in here. Amen. Turning with me in your Bibles, I'm reading Acts, the 27th chapter. And I'm going to begin to read with the 14th verse. But not long after there arose, I believe I'll change that. I believe I'll skip down and read the 20th through the 21st verses and 22nd verses. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest laid on us, and all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. That it'll be exactly like he told me it'd be. I want you to get a picture of this. They were out on the sea and a storm had arose and the boat had been rocked to and fro every wave. Looked like it might be the last wave that they was going over. The Bible said they neither seen the stars by night nor the sun by day. Fourteen days and fourteen nights they'd sailed in darkness. For fourteen days and fourteen nights they hadn't had a mouthful of food. And at the end of 14 days and 14 nights, the Bible said all hope was gone. They'd come to the place where there was nothing could be done. They were hopeless cases. The Bible said that all hope was gone. And then here comes a holy roller preacher and stands in the middle of the boat and said, Be of good cheer. Somebody said, My goodness, who let that fellow out? How in the world could a man stand in the middle of a boat that the men on board hadn't seen light of day, they hadn't seen the stars, and every one of them thought they was going to die, and a man stand in the middle of the boat and say, be of good cheer. I was standing in the corner of a hospital in Dallas, Texas. A woman came out of the doctor's office with a cancer started down the hall where I was, and when she got to the elevator, she turned to the man that was with her and said, I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing the doctors can do. They said that I was going to die, that the cancer was eating my life away. She said, isn't that terrible news? And I stood there by the elevator, the same elevator that she was going to catch and just before she stepped on the elevator I said be of good cheer she said what'd you say I said be of good cheer she said what'd you say I said be of good cheer for I believe that God can heal a cancer just like he can steal the water and cause the sun to shine and the stars to come out at night I believe that God's the same today and I laid my hands upon that woman God stretched forth his hand, and when she got on the elevator, on the way down, I prayed for her, and God completely delivered her of that old cancer. Friend, I believe God's just the same. All darkness was everywhere. All hope was gone. All hope was gone. All hope was gone. And this man stood in the middle of the boat and said, Sirs, I believe God. I believe God. I believe God that it'll be exactly like he said it today. And I believe God will do exactly what he said he did. I said I believe God will do exactly what he said he did. Cole was diagnosed with Bulpar polio. He died shortly thereafter. He was 38 years old, 82 years shy of 120 
as declared in the scripture of truth. Jack Cole was not well, and he was not healed. When it comes to Branham, this by far is my favorite picture of him. They claim a halo would appear over his head at certain times. Branham was a class act. Little lady, you're just as conscious as you can be that something happened. I'm looking right at it. That light settled right over you. I'm looking at it. I've never seen you before. I guess we're strangers to one another. If that's right, raise up your hand. There's a dark shadow around you. It's a shadow of death. You're suffering with a, a tumor's and that tumor is on your breast, both breasts. A great percent of your breasts are covered with tumor. You have one hope. If you have faith enough to touch him to do a thing like that, you're a fine person. I have a good contact with the spirit with you. You believe me to be his prophet? You know I don't know you, and you know this, you're conscious that are real sweet feelings all around you. That's that light, that glow of light. You're not from here. You're from away from here. Birmingham. I see that banana market there. Your name is Miss Vincent. That is true. Have faith in God. Now, at this time, lady, it's gone from you. That shadow that was over you has left. Now, don't you die. You'll get well. I ask anybody to come question the woman. Find out. There would be a doctor present. Why not come ask and examine? You're a little skeptic, which I know it's present. So. <laughs> but why not say it? I used to call that out, but it hurts too many feelings. What about somebody in here? On December 18, 1965, William Branham and his family, all except his daughter, Rebecca, were returning to Jeffersonville, Indiana from Tucson, Arizona for the Christmas holidays, about 6.2 miles west of Friona, Texas. Just after dark at 8.15 p.m., Branham's car collided head-on with another car that was headed westbound. The driver of the other car, 17-year-old Santiago Ramos, died at the scene and the other three passengers, Rodolfo Melendez, Rinaldo Melendez, and Danielle Coconegro, were severely injured. Branham's wife was seriously injured and their daughter, Sarah, who was laying in the back seat, was also injured. Branham's left arm was mangled and caught in the driver's side door and his left leg was wrapped around the steering wheel. About 
45 minutes, uh, Brandon was pulled from his car and transported to the hospital at Friona and then later transported to the hospital at Amarillo, Texas. He lived for six days after the crash, dying on December 24th, 1965 at 5.49 p.m. His body was returned to Jeffersonville, Indiana for burial and was finally buried on April the 11th, 1966, Easter Monday. His followers literally believed that Branham would rise from the dead and they was expecting his resurrection on Easter. That's why he wasn't buried till actually four months later in April of 1966. So they actually kept his body frozen all that time, waiting for his resurrection. Branham died as a result of an automobile fatality. He was 56 years old, 64 years shy of 120 as declared in the scripture of truth. Branham was not well and he was not healed. He died a very tragic death. Jasmine Kuhlman traveled extensively around the United States and in many other countries holding healing crusades between the 1940s and 1970s. She was one of the most well-known healing ministers in the world. Kuhlman had a weekly TV program in the 1960s and 1970s called I Believe in Miracles that was aired nationally. An estimated 2 million people claimed they were healed by Catherine Kuhlman. The extreme dramatic theatrical ministry of Benny Hinn was directly influenced by Kuhlman. If you've never had a real call from God, don't do it. I don't have to understand. It is my business to be obedient unto him. I was a one girl's army expecting to lick the world for God. He's my everything. I made the choice. I made my choice. I wish this morning I'd give anything in the world this morning. I could make the same choice for each of you. I'd give anything. I wish I could take you by the hand and present you before the Father and say to him, I've made the choice for this one. I have made the choice. I choose that this life shall be holy used for you at any cost at any price nothing from here on out will matter more than just to be the apple of thine eye with your smile dead to self two wheels having become as one but I can't go any further with you than I've gone in bearing my own soul. I've never done this before. Never. But in so doing, I can just help one of you young people. Just one of you. The choice that you make can shake the world for God. 
if I can have just one of you make the same choice that I made. Just one of you, and that can be the most unlikely person in this place. Just one of you. If what I have said and bury my soul will help you to make that choice, you may be the one who literally hit the world for God. In February of 1976, Catherine Kuhlman died shortly after having open heart surgery. She was 68 years old, 52 years shy of the 120 as declared in the scripture of truth. Coleman was not well and was not healed. Asa Alonzo Allen, known by many as A.A. A. Allen. He had a huge following starting in the late 1940s through the 1960s. He brilliantly incorporated so-called African Americans into his repertoire by using them as musicians and singers. As you know, the 1960s was a time of great social upheavals and active racism involving white supremacy was the ongoing menu. Allen was a traveling tent revivalist who at one point had a television show of his tent meetings. Body heads about. Body heads about. Do what I tell you. Many of you can be getting your last call tonight. Remember the scripture said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. God, this very moment is going to give many of you a last call. Do what I tell you. Quoting the scripture in Genesis 6 3, Better Sheep, the very scripture used as the text of study in this documentary. But notice, he failed to quote the entire verse revealing he did not understand the promise or declaration of the Most High. Like all faith healers and prosperity preachers, they know nothing of Yahuwah and his laws and commandments. Now your heads about, do what I tell you. Many of you can be getting your last call tonight. Remember the scripture said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. God, this very moment is going to give many of you a last call. Do what I tell you. I'm going to count to three. Simply one, two, and three. Listen, when I say three, that's your signal. When I say three, give you that signal. Raise your hand high if you want to be remembered in this prayer of deliverance. I'm going to pray what I call a prayer of deliverance. I prayed it for thousands of people across the nation that are saved tonight and living with God. And if you want to be remembered in this prayer, put your hand up when I say three. Get ready. This is your night. It's tonight or never. It can be heaven or hell tonight for many of you under this tent. You say, well, that prayer saved me. There's only one thing that'll save you. That's the blood of Jesus through repentance. But the devil has you in such bondage, such captivity. You're not even free to come to the Lord that you can be saved. Now I'm going to command that the devil loose the bonds. And if the chains fall off of you, they keep you in bondage. Captivity and my Lord tonight is going to save every one of you. As you come, do what I tell you. Put your hand up high when I say three. Three is your signal. It's tonight or never. Get ready. Get ready. Now start counting. I'll be through in 30 seconds. So what you do in the next 30 seconds will determine where you make heaven your home or where you spend eternity in hell without God, without a hope in the world. Get ready. Here we go. Here's the first one. Get ready. It is one. Here's the next one. Be careful, the devil's on your trail. The devil's making a bid for your soul. Here's the second one. It is two. It's solemn before God. It's tonight or never. It's tonight or never. Here's your signal. Here's your signal. Get your hand ready. Don't let any foul spirit 
Keep your hands tied in your lap. Get it ready to raise. Here you come. Every sinner of a backslider. Get your hand ready when I give you the signal. Raise it high. Here we come. Everybody pray that knows how to pray. It's now or never. Here we go. Here it is. Three. Raise your hand, everybody. Raise your hand, everybody. Slatter. Do one more thing. Leave it up there. Leave it there. Do one more thing. Everybody with your hand raised. Stand to your feet quick. I'm going to pray for you right where you stand. Quickly get to your feet. Stand to your feet fast. Quick, quick, quick. Get to your feet. Everybody to raise your hand. Stand. This is your night. This In is June your night. of 1970, A.A. A. Allen died in the Jack Tar Hotel in San Francisco, California. He was 59 years old. A 12-day investigation and autopsy reports concluded Allen died from liver failure brought on by acute alcoholism. He was 61 years shy of 120 as declared in the scripture of truth. Allen was not well and he was not healed. Now let's move on to more recent and modern faith, prosperity, and healing preachers. Kenneth Hagin has been considered by many to be the father of the modern-day faith movement. But so-called Dad Hagin, like all faith teachers and healers, has his good share of controversy and heretical teaching, much of which is carefully explained away by his most argent followers. Founder of Rama Bible Training College in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Broken Arrow, and Word of Faith Message. The Word of Faith movement has influenced world-known preachers like Charles Capps, Frederick K. C. Price, Creflo Dollar, and Kenneth Copeland. Controversy number one is that Kenneth Hagin is not actually the father of the faith movement. Mr. Hagin was evidently influenced by this man, E.W. Kenyon whose messages are strikingly similar to E.W. Kenyon's work. Call it plagiarism, call it coincidence, it doesn't matter. But because this fact, it would question the idea of Hagen being the father of the faith movement. E.W. Kenyon died in 1948. He was 80 years old, and the disparities behind his death range from old age to cancer. But Mr. Hagen wrote that Kenyon died the Bible way, without sickness. But according to the Bible, both Kenyon and Hagen died in a manner contrary to Scripture. Hagen. Which you now see and hear. They heard them speak in tongue, but what did they see? For them to think they was drunk, they must have thought they was drunk. They were acting like drunks. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 
If I remember correctly, this expression of so-called spiritual outpouring was called the laugh of faith. Kenneth Hagin died in 2003 at his kitchen table, the records reflect. He was 86 years old, 34 years shy of 120 as declared in the scripture of truth. Mr. Hagin was not well and he was not healed. Due to the vital information in this documentary, it is necessary to complete it in two parts. I will publish part two in the near future. The information in this video is meant to inform, educate, and exalt the word of the Most High against the works of men. In part two of this documentary, I will present the same identical information revealing the outcome of charismatic preachers. Please stay tuned to this series and share what the Ruach has revealed to you about this. Always to the esteem of the Most High, Elohim Yah.